There's an interesting idea due to the anthropologist Jared Diamond from his books, Guns, Germs, and Steel, that goes into why some things succeed and others fail. Basically says that for something to succeed, it must avoid multiple causes of failure. That is, things that succeed get everything right. Things that fail may fail only because one thing went wrong. Let's talk about why things might go wrong for some science fiction ideas, why they might not become real. One obvious reason is that the idea might be impossible. The laws of nature simply don't let it work. In some ways, this is the least interesting reason. There's just no way around it. Other reasons might be that it simply costs too much, people don't want to invest in it to make it possible, or it's too dangerous, maybe it is possible and cost effective, but a lot of people might die if it happened or the idea is just unacceptable. It's seen as being evil or taboo. Those ideas aren't absolute, of course. What's too expensive, for example, depends on the society and who's gonna pay for it. But they are good starting points for us to look. Let's start by looking at an idea which is probably impo just impossible. The warp drive, or more generally, traveling faster than the speed of light. This one, I think, is just impossible, despite a lot of people examining the idea seriously since around the year 1990 or so. While there is no definite proof, it probably violates the theory of relativity, which is one of the cornerstones of all of physics today. Now, when I say the theory of relativity, um, there really are, in fact, two theories of relativity the special theory of relativity that talks about objects basically moving close to the speed of light, and the general theory, which is Einstein's theory of gravitation, basically how time, how masses warp the space and time around them. Um, the special theory um, says basically that nothing that, no material object, something that actually has mass or energy, nothing like that can move faster than the speed of light. But the special theory, again, all, is not the most general case of that. The general theory of relativity, Einstein's theory of gravity, is actually the more important theory in some ways. And Einstein's general theory of relativity does indicate two workarounds to this idea. Wormholes, uh, tunnels through space-time that connect two distant regions of the universe are one of them. You know, they've been featured in the show uh, Star Trek Deep Space Nine, for example. Um, another idea is a bubble of space-time itself moving faster than the speed of light. Relativity just says that no material object can move faster than the speed of light, but it does kind of leave a loophole in that space itself, a little bubble of space, if you can think about that somehow, could actually move faster than light. Um, there are, however, issues with the, both of those ideas, either a wormhole or a space warp, a bubble of space-time moving faster than light through space. First of all, any means of moving faster than the speed of light requires something called exotic matter to make it happen. Um, this is a type of matter or energy that doesn't really work like most other types of matter. Um, it acts in some ways as if it had anti-gravity in some ways as if it repelled other masses. It may exist. There are actually some theoretical ideas that indicate that it probably does exist in, you know, in, in some weird sorts of ways, but no one knows if you can actually use it or get enough of it to create wormholes or space warps. The other problem is that faster than light travel can easily be turned into time travel, moving backwards into the past, reversing the flow of time, at least according to some people watching uh, the, the ship moving faster than the speed of light. And this looks like it's impossible from almost everything we know about physics. Most physicists to examine the problem seem to think that if you try to build a wormhole or a space warp, there are some weird quantum mechanical effects, the, the way that nature works on its ultimate very smallest levels, that will kind of destroy the uh, faster than light uh, the faster than light device, the uh, space warp or the wormhole, as soon as it tries to form. It's kind of a shame. All right, if we move on from things that are simply impossible, according to the laws of nature at least, 
Um, let's move on to another idea, other ideas which have kind of partly become true and partly not, at least in the way that science fiction uh, anticipated them. What I want to talk about right now is space travel. And of course, space travel is possible. We put people on the moon. But if we look at the science fiction predictions versus the reality of space travel, at least as it is today, there are some big differences. Um, most science fiction, from Jules Verne onwards, um, shows people playing a major role in space travel. That is to say, most science fiction concerns stories about people going off into space and exploring the unknown, and centers mainly around, around that. And science fiction writers also made very bold predictions about the future of humanity in space. The great science fiction writer Robert Heinlein wrote that human settlements on other planets, on the moon, on Mars, places like that, was as inevitable in the future as the sun rising in the east. But that hasn't happened yet. What did happen instead? Well, nowadays, most space exploration is done by robotic probes, uncrewed space missions, no people involved, at least no people on the probes. This is again not mo like most science fiction, where most stories are about space exploration by people. These uncrewed probes, like the Mars rovers, the Voyager probes, and the New Horizons missions that explored Pluto and other places like that, are all computer controlled. They have allowed us to explore the farthest reaches of the solar system, literally billions of miles away from the Earth. Closer to Earth, artificial satellites form the basis of most space commerce. They provide satellite communications and TV and the global positioning system, which is now a fundamental feature of world commerce. So we don't send people out for most ex space exploration or for the economic uses of space either. There are a few reasons for this. Current rocket technology is based around chemical rockets, which have relatively low energy density. Because of this, it's expensive to lift things into orbit. About $10,000 per pound to low Earth orbit, which is only about 200 miles above the surface of the Earth. This is for a lot of reasons, not just um, the energy density of the fuel. You're paying for a lot of infrastructure costs, along with the cost of fuel. But what this means, of course, is that the smaller the probe, the better. Developments in computer technology made this easier, and I'm gonna talk about this more later on. Um, additionally, scientists in the 1960s also figured out how to use gravity assists to make probes go farther or faster or change direction in space, which helps a lot with overall fuel requirements. But this helps most on long missions because you are trading energy for time. These maneuvers make trips a lot longer while saving on energy costs and also mean that you have to wait for the planets to align correctly for the launch windows. And again, this works very well for uncrewed deep space missions, but the time scales involved mean that so far they haven't been used for missions with people aboard. In fact, there have been no deep space crewed missions ones beyond the moon, ones with people on them. The Apollo missions were one of the greatest achievements of the human race. We put people on the moon 232,000 miles from Earth, but no astronaut has ever been farther from Earth than this, while uncrewed missions have gone again to the edges of the solar system and quite literally beyond that. Again, billions of miles away. Um, in fact, since the Apollo missions ended, humans have never been farther from Earth than basically low Earth orbit, maybe 200 miles up to maybe 400 miles up above the surface of the Earth. That is um, no farther than New York or New England is from Washington, DC. Why is that? Well, there are a bunch of reasons. Expense is one of them. Crewed missions, ones with people on them, are certainly possible, but they are hundreds of times more expensive than uncrewed missions for very simple reasons. You need to keep people alive in the harsh environments of space for extended periods of time if you want a, you know, a crewed mission with people, you know, with going out pretty far away from Earth. Um, 
you need to provide oxygen, you need to provide um, food, you need to protect them from, the, um, from again, the, env the environment of space, from its vacuum, from the temperatures of space, and so on. And this is hard enough for missions that only last a few days, but sending people to Mars, for example, would involve them living in deep space for years at a time. Um, now, of course, people have lived on space stations for long periods of time, but uh, the near-Earth environment of the International Space Station, for example, is different than the environment between Earth and Mars. The International Space Station, again, is 220 miles up, whereas Mars is tens of millions of miles away from Earth, even at its closest approach. Um, the International Space Station is protected from radiation by Earth's Van Allen belts, and it's also close enough that if something goes wrong, we can try to send a mis mission up for support or for rescue. Now this highlights another feature beyond the expense of crewed space missions, which is the danger of them. Um, it, it, for example, looking at the space shuttle, the space shuttle went to low Earth orbit only. And yet, out of 50 shuttle missions, two blew up, killing about 14 people. On the other hand, if an uncrewed mission fails, it only destroys some equipment. A trip to Mars would be much more dangerous than a shuttle mission for many reasons. There are also more subtle dangers to health as well. Again, something like a mission to Mars would expose astronauts to unacceptably high levels of radiation during the trip. Such long space trips of years in duration are forced on us because of the chemical rockets we use for space missions today.